everyone. Welcome to 2024 AI in Education Trends, how AI has impacted my educator role. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Paul Cotter. I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Stukent, and I'm thrilled to be with you today to be hosting this event. As we begin, I want to encourage you to use the chat feature. Go ahead and start by sharing where you're from. Let us know where you're at, which school you're at. Uh, you can even let us know which courses you're teaching right now. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat. Our amazing team is standing by to answer your questions in real time throughout today's event. Besides today's amazing event, we have many more coming up, including how to utilize a simulation in your course, mastering the art of teaching public speaking to Gen Z students, and our panel discussion titled Increasing Student Employability and Career Readiness. Be sure to follow the link at the bottom left part of your screen to learn more and register for each of these exciting events. So welcome Gary from Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida, Greg from Nebraska, David from Toronto, Ed from Chattanooga State, uh, Bill from Houston Community College. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are excited to have all of you with us. If you can't stick around for all of today's sessions, don't worry. We plan to share the recording with all attendees along with any links or resources that have been shared or will be shared throughout this event. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation today. And this goes without saying, but please be respectful and polite when commenting. Today, we will be sharing 10 AI resources for your classroom. This will be at the end of the presentation. But right now, we have a special gift to everyone attending. We want to offer you free instructor access to our various up-to-date courseware and simternships. I want to emphasize up-to-date because unlike many other publishers, Stukent updates every single year to ensure that you're teaching with the very latest information. This includes AI. Stukent authors have added a plethora of new AI content to their courseware, including case studies, assignments, discussion prompts, and even whole chapters. So go ahead and click on the link below to browse our library and request your free instructor access. While you're taking a second to request access, let me introduce and welcome Dr. Mernoush Rashadi to the stage. Dr. Mernoush is an assistant professor of marketing with a diverse professional journey. Before entering academia, she obtained her BA in finance and worked in financial services and management consulting before pursuing her graduate studies in China, India, and the US, culminating in a global MBA degree and a career in marketing. She received her doctorate from Texas Tech University and has taught digital marketing, social media marketing and analytics and other courses for nearly five years. Mernoush is very passionate about unlocking the potential of emerging technologies to reshape marketing strategies and drive societal impact. Her research delves into the intersection of technology and marketing, exploring the transformative potential of artificial intelligence, autonomous products, and synthetic media. She also studies the, di the dynamics of social media platforms, online brand experiences, and the creator econ economy. She serves on both AI and analytics task force within her college and has been using AI in her academic role since 2022. Mernoush, the time is yours. We want to invite you onto the stage right now. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Well, thank you everyone for joining this webinar on a Friday. I know your time is very valuable and I appreciate you choosing to attend this session on your Friday. 
Well, as uh, Paul gave a great introduction, uh, I'm an assistant professor. I'm very new to academia. I graduated in 2022 and I moved to California working for California State University Fullerton. Uh, I appreciate Paul's introduction and the help and support of all the student team. But uh, given the time limits, I would like to move to the topic of discussion and uh, how AI has impacted my educator role and maybe some conversations and suggestions on how you can benefit from AI while having all the concerns that every one of us probably has about AI. And I want to make this disclaimer that a lot of the imagery that you see in the slides were created by AI purposefully. And it, of course, takes a lot of time. But if you see they are not up to perfect standards, it's purposeful because I would like to show you some of the creation that AI can do for you and for your job and how I have been using it. So the cover photo that you see is actually an AI image generated using Adobe Firefly. And it took me quite a few hours to get it, but I don't know if it's working or not. But uh, I'm very happy to be here and talk to you about AI and how it impacts my role and yours as well. Well, if you would mind uh, moving to the next slides. Thank you. Well, probably covered majority of these, but I want to add a little bit to my background. Uh, I do research in technology. I also teach digital social media marketing and analytics, and I've been incorporating technology, AI, and new emerging tech within my coursework for four years. Um, I do research on technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, synthetic media, and AI was just part of my studies. And I was very interested in technology. I started reading about technology, literature, researching it when I was in my PhD program. And this was before generative AI started. So one of the first apps or websites that I started using was this uh, company called Synthesia. They create these virtual avatars that you can type whatever message that you want, and the avatar uses deep fake technology to speak. So I was experimenting with this uh, technology. My students were interested, so they started using it to send funny messages. So we started early in 2020 to incorporate some of these technologies into my educator role to just playing around and teaching them within my courses. So I tell my students about virtual reality, robots, augmented reality, deep fakes, virtual influencers. So the conversation kept going on and moving on till generative AI came. And as soon as generative AI came, I was signed up as part of the beta programs for ChatGPT. There was a Doodle app that we were testing in class. So I've been playing around with a lot of the AI apps to explore what they can offer and how I can incorporate them in my jobs and in my classrooms. But I can definitely say I am not a technical AI expert. So if you ask me about the uh, data analysis behind the scenes, about how the coding works, I cannot say I have much expertise in that area. So I use it as an application from the front facing. This is the app. This is what it can do. This is how we use. So if you have limited knowledge similar to me of what happens behind the scene, this is the perfect place for you. And there's a ton you can gain from AI. And there's a lot that your students are already doing without knowing much. So this is a great place to talk about how we can use AI and how AI has impacted us without talking too much about the algorithm and technical stuff. Uh, Paul, if you mind, please move to the next slide. So before we start, I would really like to know where everyone here stands in regard to AI. So if you can answer this poll question and tell us how familiar you are with generative AI. I see the responses coming in. That's great. Very familiar. OK. Quite a lot of people somewhat familiar. OK. OK. 
that's great. Let's give a few more seconds for everyone to be able to respond, and then we can talk about what is AI, why we are talking about it, and how everyone is feeling about it. So far, I see that quite a few people feel they are very familiar. That's great if you are feeling that you're on top of AI, you're familiar with the different apps, you have been using it, you're way ahead of everyone else. But those of you who have not familiar with yourself, there's nothing to be afraid of. There are quite a lot of people who have not even touched AI, who have not delved into what AI does. And if you're in this webinar, it means you're still ahead of the curve. Uh, I think uh, there is a research that reports about less than 30% of faculty are actually involved or somewhat familiar with AI. So you are part of the early adopters if you're already here. All right, I think we have quite a lot of the answers in. So about 39% are very familiar, 47 somewhat familiar, not very familiar, 8%, and a few people who are not familiar at all. And again, like I said, the community within faculty, educators, there is a range of familiarity. I do research on AI, so I am probably at the top of the numbers being very familiar. There are people who are much more advanced than me. And then, of course, there are other people who are just starting, who have been waiting to get on board with AI. And it's absolutely fine if you don't know anything about it. And we are going to talk about it, so now you will know about it. Uh, Paul, if you mind, please go to the next slide. But considering that we have a range of different uh, knowledge levels, uh, to be on the same page, uh, let me define AI and wha what we are talking about within this webinar. So generative AI is a technology that uses deep learning models to generate content based on some input or prompt from the user. What that means in simpler terms that we can all understand is it's just a form of algorithm. It's just a computer program. They call it artificial intelligence, but let's not uh, get that scare us off. It's just a computer code that allows creation of new items, new content. It could be sound, it could be images, it could be video, it could be just a piece of text. And it uses uh, data and its training data to learn patterns from the data and apply it to a new context. So it's just pattern recognitions within data. It does the same thing that a lot of us do. You look at a document, you look at your students' work, and among your entire class, you kind of recognize a pattern. Maybe the questions are too hard. Maybe your students misunderstood something. So you can recognize a pattern and then readjust and apply that to something else or to a new assignment. AI does the same thing. It uses some data set, recognizes the patterns, and then applies that to a set of new contexts or new areas. And the tools we have now, um, they cover sound generation, video generation, text generation. Of course, ChatGPT is the most famous one for that. But we have a lot of capabilities, and the more and more are developing. And they are developing at a very fast pace. So we started from November of 2022 with ChatGPT. We are almost one and a half year into it. There are new versions. The capabilities have expanded. Uh, the AI can now recognize uh, other patterns, it can produce data sets, it can analyze data while it started from very low quality, just text analysis. Now we have video analysis with Sora coming out, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to, it, but uh, it has a long way to go. Uh, image generation, we had Midjourney that started in 2022. The first version, if you have ever watched the news, we had images that would come out with like seven fingers on one hand, but now the AI has improved so much and they've changed the algorithm so much that it can now produce realistic looking images of human beings to perfection. So it's a fast moving area. It's, there are a lot of apps coming and it becomes very overwhelming for faculty and educators to 
try to keep up with all the information to uh, learn all the apps that are there, all the possibilities, and then consider all the limitations and the downfalls of AI before incorporating them in their role and in their classes. So before I discuss the next topic, I want to ask a follow-up question. Uh, Paul, if you don't mind, next slide. Thank you. So I want to have a poll here and see how do you perceive the impact of AI on your role as an educator? Do you believe this is positive? Do you feel this is very negative? How do you feel about AI? Okay, great. So I see quite a few people believe it's very positive. A lot of people believe it's somewhat positive, some neutral, and a few people who believe it's somewhat negative or negative. And I think I understand everyone's point of view. So this would be my follow-up question for you. Uh, Paul, if you can show the next slide. Thank you. So um, please use the chat option and respond to this. I know even those of us who believe AI can have a positive impact, we still have reservations and uh, concerns about the use of AI. So if you can share what are your concerns and uh, we can talk about all of those uh, as we go through the slides. So uh, what are your main concerns about AI in your role as an educator? Okay, I see student cheating, students use AI to commit academic misconduct. Yes, so academic misconduct is one of the biggest concern and one of the earliest topic of discussion that happened in my campus. Every faculty, even myself, we were concerned about students cheating, using AI and submitting the work generated by AI as their own creation. Uh, making sure I can educate the students. Uh, that's a very good concern that we all have. Uh, this is a skill. It seems like industry has adopted it. Our students need to learn these skills. So trying to incorporate AI as a new skill into courses or developing brand new courses around AI has been a challenge and a topic of discussion even in my campus. And I have some experience with it. Um, Student writing all their homework and assignments with ChatGPT or other generative AI. Okay, uh, plagiarism, uh, incorporating AI with research and writing. Okay, uh, students reply on AI instead of us. Students thinking AI is a proxy for thinking and by bringing value to employers, teaching students how to properly use AI. AI is not smart enough and give the wrong answer. Fantastic. Okay how to use AI responsibly as a tool, accuracy of its response, students believing everything AI generates is true, how to use AI and not abuse it. So I see that a lot of the concerns that you have mentioned are shared by me and my colleagues and the discussions that we've had uh, on my campus and the webinars that I attend discuss similar uh, issues. So let's discuss how AI has impacted my role and how these topics and these issues come into play. So Paul, could you show the next slide? Thank you. So a little bit about my personal experience with AI. So my approach has been a cautious optimism. I felt like AI is a good tool to help me in a lot of the aspects, but of course it's a new technology it has a lot of ethical issues that come with it so i'm cautious optimism approach to ai i don't think this is the same approach for a lot of uh, educators i know quite a lot of uh, colleagues who avoid ai at all costs they despise it they do not want to learn it but my approach is a little different so coming from this perspective 
I have been exploring AI capacity from ChatGPT, image generators, mid-journey, and other tools for quite some time. I cannot say I have mastered the prompt engineering tactics, especially on mid-journey, but it's been a journey of discovery and it's been fun. And I started it uh, with playing around with ChatGPT. I had no plan of using ChatGPT directly for my role, but when it came out in November of 2022, it was around end of the semester. I had the time off between the two semesters. So I spent the majority of my time during that one month time off exploring AI and pushing its boundaries. And very similar to every new technology that comes out. Uh, for example, when Siri came out, a lot of people were asking like, hey Siri, do you have a boyfriend? Hey Siri, where do you live? Hey Siri, uh, what do you eat? So it was just funny questions. They were trying to see if Siri had a response. So I played around with ChatGPT in the same manner. So I was trying to see, can ChatGPT give me responses? If I'm rude to it, the AI, would it respond in kind and be rude to me? Would the responses be different if I said please versus if I ordered it to do something? And then Exploration expanded into, let's see if it can give me factual information. Can it give me more information about my field, about the courses that I teach? Can it replicate something I'm doing within its data? So I kept pushing the boundaries and exploring as much as I could. And it's been entertaining and it's been uh, interesting to see how far it can go and what responses it can give. But as many of you said, uh, AI, especially ChatGPT, has limitations on giving factual data. And we can talk about data AI hallucinations or giving you incorrect information that you, a lot of people believe is accurate. So it does have issues, but it's been a journey of discovery. Um, so I started playing around with AI, but I also wanted to incorporate it to some extent in my courses to see if my students can handle or if they are exposed to it. So in November of 2022, while I was testing out ChatGPT, I talked to my students about these new topics that have come out. They had a lot of concerns. They wanted to test it out. I had a few students who were very advanced, testing everything out, doing things on their own, and I had some who were afraid of their future job and what it means. So there were a lot of conversations between me and my students about AI and generative AI. So I still don't have answers for them. They still ask me about like what happens to our job opportunities. So I still haven't figured out good responses for them. And it's just an adjustment. And the best response I've had so far is this is happening. This is a new skill. I'm going to teach you as much as I can so you can adapt to the new job market and be ahead of everyone else who can, has not learned it yet. So we are shifting our education and our coursework and design to incorporation of AI. And I'm one of the faculty who started much early. So one of the first assignments that I uh, added to my classroom, this was within a consumer behavior course. And um, I had students who had to design a campaign based on uh, analysis of consumer behavior within for a project. So they were designing this um, Halloween ad campaign and there was an AI that was free. It did not require subscription. It did not require sign up. So I knew students don't have to expose any personal information, but it was very fun because they could doodle anything that they could imagine and the AI would turn the doodle into an image and they use that image within their ad campaign. And they had a lot of fun with it. And I incorporated the activity as an extra credit. So if any of the students weren't feeling comfortable with the AI, they would not miss out on a grade. It was not mandatory. It was just to encourage them to explore some of these safer options. So we started with something very small that they could have fun with it. And I remember I had a few students who came back and said that they have opened the website for their younger siblings on their tablets. So now their siblings are doodling and turning that into paintings and full on images uh, that they're sharing with everyone. So they have now become digital artists. Um, but that was an early version and that was one of the early assignments that I had. And 
as we moved on every month, I would add something new, some additional discussion. And the development has expanded to a point that now all of my classes have a form of AI assignment. So I teach social media marketing and analytics right now. My students worked two weeks ago on an assignment that they have to come up with a social media strategy for a nonprofit organization and develop a content marketing planning for them. So the assignment forces the students to come up with a strategy and the ideas on their own as a team, and then develop the same task and the same strategy and ideas using AI. And then here's the kicker that helps push every student beyond just using ChatGPT and cheating. They are forced to compare the results of the two. So they create their own ideas and then they create it using AI and then they compare the two. And I've been doing this in uh, the past three semesters. And it's been very interesting because I know a lot of the faculty have this issue that students are not going to learn if they use AI. Students are not going to develop critical thinking skills. F students are going to cheat. They're never going to learn how to do these things and they're going to rely on AI. So experimenting with AI and forcing my students to do a comparison has been very useful in this aspect because now they are forced to analyze both of the results and compare them. And usually about 90% of them come back and say the results from our team brainstorming is more creative, it has more variety in it, it is better than the AI. They do like some aspects of the AI generated responses, but majority say they're team brainstorming. I have used the similar activities in other classes and I have seen the results. Um, just this is very um, subjective, so I don't have the data to share with you, but I've seen that doing an activity like this, a comparison between your work, a teamwork, or and the AI and a critical analysis of side by side of the result helps the students to realize their capacity, how much they have learned, what skills they are lacking, and what areas the AI can help them. So from the experiments and the results of these assignments, I've seen that students who are in their early career, so people who haven't had an internship, they have not yet worked, and they have limited experience, they benefit from AI. The AI is giving them some ideas, it sparks, sparks and idea in their head, and they can take that to a further extent. They can develop that. So it gives them that tiny little nudge that, hey, maybe this is where you need to start. And now they can follow that through. For students who have more experience, they have work, they are older, the AI has a different impact. So it takes away the pressure from brainstorming hundreds of ideas. So they know what to do. They have a starting point but coming up with multiple ideas and then deciding what's the best outcome requires a lot of effort and energy. So the AI is helping those students in this aspect. It gives them multiple ideas. Now they can use a process of elimination or decide between them based on their experience. So it's helping both naive or early career students and more advanced or expert students at the same time. And doing the same thing with teens, I have noticed that they've learned that generating ideas within a team with their collective intelligence results in better outcomes compared to an AI, especially with ChatGPT. So it's a great way to incorporate AI, tell them how limited AI capacity is and how there's still value in human-generated work and skills and learning all of these tactics. So they're actually more eager to learn and they come back and they tell me like, oh, I realize I don't know this part a lot. So I asked AI to teach me or they go back to their textbook or their material and read that section more. So it actually encourages my students to go back and learn the stuff that they had missed or they had decided to procrastinate. So they cover those areas because now they know even using AI, they need this. So it's a great um, exercise if you want to incorporate it to, to do a comparison of human generated ideas versus AI generated ideas and do a critical analysis of, hey, 
tell me which one looks better. Tell me which one created a better idea, which one is more creative, which one is more logical. So comparing at different levels of both creativity and logic. So right brain and left brain skills, comparison between the AI and humans is extremely beneficial. And that's what I have been doing for quite the past few semesters. Um, some, uh, I do a lot of activities with AI. So they do generate images, they do generate text. Um, thankfully, uh, the structure of my classes are different and this has been very helpful for using AI. So I know a lot of faculty have concerns about students plagiarizing, student cheating. So some forms of assignment, for example, essays, it's very easy to use AI or ChatGPT. Type in there, I want a two page essay on this topic. It writes it, maybe they edit it. Sometimes they don't even bother and just copy and paste. So it's very challenging to stop the students to from cheating on essays or writing assignments, especially if they are generic and not unique to your classroom. So, and it is extremely hard to recognize if it is AI generated or not. And I wanna bring this up here to, because it's a important issue. So we sometimes have a feeling that an assignment was cheated and it's plagiarized using AI, but we, don't know for sure. There are supposedly tools that can recognize AI generated text. But here is a disclaimer or warning that I'm going to share with everyone. Uh, these tools do not work. So please, please don't use them. For example, we have this um, software Turnitin that I think a lot of faculty are used to using it. You implement it into your learning platform, whether it's Canvas, it's Blackboard, whatever tool that you're using and it can check your students' work against a body of work that's online websites, other students' submissions. So prior plagiarism tools were fine because it would check for major copy paste or similarities between the text. But now they have added the options to recognize AI generated text, but it is impossible to say if this is AI or if this was a human being writing. So we actually, there's some research and there are some news that shows that people from different cultures use different wording. There is a paper that was recently, I believe published, um, or it's a pre-published pre paper that talks about recognizing certain words that are used when it is AI generated. So if this word is mentioned in a text, this is tagged as an AI generation. But if you consider not everyone is an English native language user, not everyone speaks English. So if you are an international scholar, an international student, you're using a thesaurus, a dictionary to find synonyms, or maybe your brain works very similar to mine. I think in my native tongue, and then I translate that to English. And in that translation, some of the words I use do not have the nuances of an English native language speaker. So those words may be tagged as AI generated, even though it was my original thought. So turn it in other AI uh, recognition software that says whether this was human or AI generated, they have a lot of false positive. They accuse students mistakenly for using AI. So I made the mistake of using a software once very early on and I regretted it because I talked to a student, I asked them that this was AI generated and it was a very bad interaction. Since that, I have learned to not use it. Instead, I have changed my teaching, my assessments. I have changed how I approach teaching. So I use a flip classroom uh, model which is basically students learn the textbook, the material before class, they come to the class for a very short lecture, so 15, 20 minutes, and then the entirety of the class time is focused on doing their homework and group projects. So they do what they were supposed to do at home in front of me. So that prevents them from going on ChatGPT and copy and pasting. I've also changed the formatting of the assignment. So now I use um, 
different projects, I use assignments that are unique to me. So there are a ton of switches that we as educators have to do, and that's what I have done so far. Um, and um, I want to talk about a few other topics because AI is important. We all have a lot of concerns, and I see that I'm running out of time. So, uh, Paul, why don't we move on to the next slide so I can address some of the concerns that everyone has. So, as an educator, AI is very helpful. Uh, you can actually, uh, me and my colleagues and my co-authors have a paper that's on the review uh, that discusses how you can actually use generative AI for your educator role. It can help you with course design, for course development, for writing your syllabus, for writing course objectives, for changing the language of your syllabus and course to something more inclusive and more friendly that would encourage students to learn. You can use AI for creating assessment tools from case studies, from projects, even uh, test banks for your exams. So um, there's a ton that you can do using AI. Unfortunately, I can't divulge too much about the paper because it's under review, but I will be happy to share the paper when it is uh, officially published. So, but there's a lot that you can do as an educator. But we also have to consider the limitations. So Paul, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. So um, I want to talk about uh, one of the biggest thing, and this is a uh, bias uh, within AI and uh, AI generated content. So there is a, a medium paper that was talking about this uh, image generation. So I want to, I want you to pay attention to the photos that you see. So they had asked AI to create images of a group of soldiers who are taking a selfie and throughout history. So if you move 200 years back and you ask Native Americans to take a selfie, how would it look? So the images that AI created are on the left hand side. If you take a notice, you will see everyone is smiling with a big smile showing their teeth, which is an absolutely American smile. A lot of cultures, including mine, when we smile, we do not have such big smiles. It's very uh, closed mouth, very mellow, slight edges on your mouth. So AI was trained on data on American culture. So now when they were asked to generate images, the images come out as AI biased towards American culture. So as you see the photos, everyone's having a big smile, while in original photos, from those cultures, you can see their smiles are different. So bias in AI happens a lot. It happens for cultural uh, issues, uh, ability. So yesterday I asked uh, Firefly to create images for these slides. And every time I typed in a professor, it would give me an image of a man in their late seventies. If I asked a college faculty, it would give me an image of a young man. When I asked female, faculty, Firefly would give me images of female of uh, ethnic background, which was great. So it seems like Firefly has adjusted their previous generated images, which were all white, blonde, light uh, skin color. Now they have over adjusted to another part. So in 30 something images that it produced for me, there wasn't a single white woman with blonde hair. Every single one had darker skin, African-American, uh, Southern Indians. So they were slightly too far adjusted. So now they do have to adjust it again. And bias plays a big role, especially as an educator. So for example, I ask AI to generate case studies for class discussion. And then it gives me examples, it never includes an, an African-American entrepreneur as the manager for the company. It's always a man. It's always a white American. So I have to force the AI to adjust these case studies and assignments and projects to give me examples that match my student population. I work in a um, Hispanic serving and Asian serving uh, community. So I always have to adjust the biases in AI and force it to give me outputs that match the context I want to teach. So bias plays a big role and we all should be aware of it and we should all talk about it. 
and consider it when we are playing around with AI and using it in classroom. But there are also other concerns. Uh, Paul, if you can show the next slide. Uh, so there are other issues that we should all be aware of. So sources of the data that were used are questionable. Sometimes they are not accurate. So that results in inaccurate information from the AI. Privacy and data protection. So if you don't know, everything that you're putting into any AI goes and becomes part of the data. So I can ask a question that you had privately asked AI to produce, and it might tell me your research because you use the AI. So there is only one solution to it. From all the tools that I have seen, only the enterprise subscriptions protect the enterprise's data. So this is what we call a vault garden. Uh, my university has a subscription to Microsoft Copilot. So I know if I input something in there, that data is not going to be part of the AI. It's never going to use that and produce an output for someone else. So we need to consider this. If you're putting students' information, your personal information, your research paper, it will become part of the AI. And it may result in someone else getting the same ideas and the same results, and it may result in additional plagiarism. So you have to be very cognizant of this privacy and data protection and use walled gardens to protect yourself and your students. Hallucinations and misinformation, of course, is the next thing. We all know, especially ChatGPT gives wrong citations. It gives wrong information. You can tell it a piece of information is wrong, and it will apologize to you for giving you the wrong information and says, oh, yes, you're right. Here's the correct information. So it's very easy to trick it to give you a different answer and say, okay, this is it. So we have to be very careful and I teach my students how to triangulate information. So use multiple sources, multiple AI and their own logic to compare the results before saying, here is my final answer. So triangulation and teaching how to uh, learn about AI hallucination is very important. Accessibility is another issue. Uh, but it's beyond our time limit. Uh, so I'm going to jump over some of these. And of course, there are many other concerns that are just any AI and anyone who uses it needs to consider it. Uh, Paul, can you move to the next slide? So for faculty, um, considering all of these ethics and moral obligations are important. Um, something that me and my colleagues have concerned personally as academics is the time commitment. Learning AI takes time, it's a new skill. I have been playing around with AI for more than 300 hours and we all have full-time jobs, we all have a lot of commitment. So finding these times to learn the skill is very hard. So getting your organization, getting your institution administration, the buy-in, to give you time releases, to give you less teaching courses, give you time off to learn these skills has been a challenge. And I'm an advocate for that. And right now, as part of the AI task force in my college, we are developing a plan. We are trying to find a way for our faculty to learn this as a new skill so then they can transfer this to the students. So it's a challenge and a concern for a lot of faculty and people that I talk to. And we all need to find a solution to it. I personally work more than necessary to the extent that work-life balance is out of uh, balance, I would say. But, and I do not recommend that, but it's something that we need to consider. So if uh, you have very limited time, I would suggest find one tool, explore it a little bit, spend maybe an hour every few weeks that you can. So you know something about it until the time that you can sit down and play more and learn more about it. So exploration in limited capacity is still very helpful. Um, then we um, another topic that comes a lot is institutional policy, policies. Um, some universities don't want you to use it. Some people say use it in certain capacity. But as a faculty, you have academic freedom. You have your own logic and judgment. So within institutional policies, you have some degree of freedom to reject the AI or accept it and use it. Thankfully, no one has told me so far that there is an issue with AI. So I've been experimenting and my students are using it as well. 
Um, of course, uh, misconduct with the research. I'm very conservative when it comes to using AI within research. I do not use it for idea generation. I do not use it for writing of the paper. I do use it as a dictionary. So sometimes I'm stuck. I cannot think of the exact word. I type in, this is the sentence I want to write. This is what I mean. Give me multiple uh, suggestions for a word that I can use. So it's kind of like a thesaurus for me. And of course, I use Grammarly for grammar check and formatting check. So that's the extent I use it for research. But I know people who use it in more advanced. I would caution everyone for using it for research because journal editors and policies are really restrict and it has severe repercussions for using AI in research. So be more cognizant if you are trying to learn AI, uh, generative AI. I would say there are AI tools aside from generative AI that are very useful for research. For example, connected papers which uses um, keyword matching and course citation matching to find relevant papers to a paper that you have recognized. So it's very helpful for when you're starting doing literature review for a new stream, you find one paper instead of spending hours and hours through Google Scholar to find random papers, it tells you, hey, here are 20 other papers that you might want to read. It's a great tool, but it does not give you a summary of the paper as some people use AI for, and I do not recommend using those. But AI versus generative AI, very useful tool. And uh, I see a comment, the image on the slide was generated using Firefly. It took me quite a few attempts, but yes, it is AI generated. Um, Paul, can we move on to the next slide? So for the students, we all concerned about plagiarism, and I think I already addressed some of this and some strategies I have thought of to address it. Uh, for student learning, I'm doing my best to teach my students what they have recognized an assumption I had made. I assume all of my students know how to use ChatGPT. And two weeks ago, this came as a shock that when I asked 40 students in my social media class that how many of you have used ChatGPT and know how to do this assignment, two of them told me that they have never used it. And it came as a shock to me because I have assumed they know how to do this. So I had to develop some additional instructional material of this is ChatGPT, this is how a prompt works, this is how you create a prompt, how you use the tool. So I had to take a step back and actually teach them this is the basic steps to use ChatGPT and how you use it before they can actually use the tool to do their assignment. So check your assumptions. Uh, this was the first time this happened. Uh, I've had majority of my students know how to use it. And in teamwork, usually if one of them knows, they teach each other, but not all the students already know. So that's another thing to uh, consider. And then um, we are developing new courses in our college for AI. We are checking every topic and how we can incorporate an AI module or a SIG topic into individual um, courses. So if you're teaching marketing research, maybe have one or two weeks about how to use AI for marketing research. Analytics, the same thing. Strategy, the same thing. And then standalone AI in marketing courses. So there are different versions of how you can incorporate AI into your curriculum and uh, your programs. And these are all topics that require further discussions and it's going to take one or two years for everyone to jump on it. There are universities like Wharton who are already teaching AI, but some of the institutions are slower in developing this. And uh, Paul, if we can move to the next slide. And uh, as closing remarks, I want to say that AI is here to say there is no escaping it and there is no running away. So it's best for us to start learning as much as we can. Students, industry, higher education, government, everyone is going to use it. So rejecting it might not be an option. Uh, we do have some academic freedom to some extent. So it's up to you to choose how much of AI and what AI tools and algorithms you want to incorporate. Use your academic freedom and your logic based on your comfort. I'm a little more cautious optimism, so I incorporated more than my colleagues. Um, we have a long journey for having an unbiased, reliable AI, so always check your assumptions, ask the AI and push it to produce and adjust 
the results to include more inclusivity and diversity and representation in the results. And as a recommendation, I would highly suggest take it as a one step at a time because there are so many AI tools out there. It's overwhelming, especially some of them require their own language. Like Midjourney, you have to learn how to code in Midjourney language. So it's painful to learn. It's a very steep learning curve and it becomes overwhelming especially when you start into AI field and you see everyone is talking about AI, everyone is ahead of you, you start getting stressed and anxious, like how far behind I am? What do I do? How much more do I need to learn to get to that level? So forget everyone else, do whatever you can one step at a time and go slowly on your own pace and start by a single tool. Don't try to learn everything at the same time. And uh, I want to reference the image that's on the right, and I can share the article. This is a great template or um, framework they have developed that centers a human being and your vision at the center of all the AI. Then it comes your um, all your assumptions, all the tools. So I will share the article as one of the resources so you can check it out. But definitely remember that AI always at the center of it, it should be your human vision. It should be your idea that's running AI. You should be telling ChatGPT, this is my vision. This is what I want. This is what I want you to give me. So it's a human-centered vision, whatever AI you use. And then at the end of it, knowledge is power. So even if you object to the AI, the more you know about it, the more your students know about it, you can make a more educated decision. Do I want to pursue this technology? Do I want to incorporate it? So the more you know, you can make better decisions, even if you decide to reject AI. So that's all I wanted to say. I know we are out of time. I want to pass it on for a Q&A. So Paul, if you can move and open the floor for all the questions that everyone has, that would be great. And thank you for listening to me so far. Yes, thank you, Mermaid. This has been amazing, so informative, lots of great information here. We did ask for questions as people were registering. And so there were there was a common theme in a lot of those questions that were submitted during the registration process. And I know you talked about this a little, but is there anything you would add to the question, how do or would you address plagiarism and are you able to enforce anything? Um, from my experience and from conversations we've had with our admin, our university, um, they recommend not to enforcing or using any AI plagiarism tools because the false accusation is a high price for students and for you. Because if you accuse of a student, you need to prove that they did cheat and that damages your reputation as a faculty. It impacts your relationship with current and future students. It impacts the image of the institution. There's been news articles about students who were placed on probation because their assignments were tagged as AI generated and why they had worked on it. So enforcing it is nearly impossible with the technology we have right now. Um, I personally would go against anyone using uh, AI plagiarism recognition tool. And I would just go by trust and adjusting the assignments. Make your students show your progress. Maybe divide the projects into multiple weeks with multiple deliveries so you know they are doing. Even if it's AI generated, they still have to do multiple weeks of it. So. I have a project in my consumer behavior. They have to de deliver 12 weekly um, smaller tasks. So I know they are working on it. Even if it's AI, I don't have control on it. But I know they didn't give it to AI on one sitting and say, hey, do this. So at least they had to go back and move and reiterate the same thing. And maybe through that process, they learned something. So no, I would say it's nearly impossible to recognize it or use any tools at this point. So be very cautious if you are doing it or if you ever make that accusation that a student has plagiarized using AI. Thanks for that advice. Sure. What AI tools do you see as critical for educators to be familiar with within the next 12 months? That's a great question. Um, so 
I would say text-based AI is the main thing that everyone needs to learn or start exploring. That could mean ChatGPT. The free version with the GPT three and a half is a good start, but we all know it is not the best algorithm or it was not trained on a good data. So if you can afford to pay for the subscription, which is $20 a month, it will add rack up over months if you pay for it, but it is a better algorithm. Uh, your university, because you subscribe to Microsoft Office, or Microsoft 365, you may actually have access to Microsoft Bing or Microsoft Copilot in a vault garden, which protects your data. So you might want to explore with that. It does have limitations on the daily prompts that you can give. I think the cap is 30 per day, but that's a good tool to use. And it's a it gives you access to GPT-4, which is a better algorithm. There is Bard, there is Gemini, there are a lot of tools, but everyone is using ChatGPT. I would suggest Copilot. I actually have the app on Copilot app on my cell phone. I haven't built the habit of using it all the time, but anything that comes up that I'm on my phone sitting in front of the feed, I tap it in Copilot. Hey, give me this. So it gives me ideas, it gives, helps me write emails, things like that. So it's just helpful on a day to day basis. And if you can build a habit, Using Copilot, ChatGPT would be enough. There are other ones, but like I said, it's your choice. The algorithms are different, but text-based text AI should be your first step. The next one would be uh, image generation, which takes a lot of time to develop a good image, so I do not recommend getting too much into detail. And then there are voice synthesis, which I highly recommend you start learning it especially if you're teaching online and need to record videos for a course, this comes very handy. It took me 13 hours to develop a 20 minute video for an online class because you record it, re-record it and re-record it. And then you have to sit down and cut down and edit everything. It, it's very time consuming. So now we have the technology that you can take maybe a two minute video of yourself or your image, create a virtual avatar of your own and then they use AI and deepfake technology. So your image now can speak on your behalf. So you type whatever you want and it speaks even with your voice. So it does cost money, uh, but I would say it is worth not having to record for work for 14 hours for a 20 minute video. So that might be something that you can look into next. Syntasia does this, uh, Eleven Labs creates uh, audio synthesis so it can uh, replicate or clone my voice. So these are the things I'm exploring, but I haven't taken, given the students the final product. So these are the things that everyone can uh, look into. Well, this has been wonderful, Marnoush. Thank you so much for sharing all this information with us today, your insights and your experience that you've had in the classroom using, using these resources. Um, that's all we have time for today. As a reminder, we do have a special gift for everyone attending today. We've put together 10 AI resources for you to download. On the landing page, you'll see a section titled Ultimate AI Resource with a section for marketing, comms, and business instructors. Each guide features discussion prompts, activities, and even a list of industry tools to use in your course and to share with your students. At the very bottom of the page, we've included some links to our most popular and most recent AI webinars that you can watch for free. Um, and this includes accounting analytics and content marketing. At Stukent, we host many virtual events throughout the year and we're always looking to partner with educators to share new insights for business marketing and communication professors, just like today. If you have enjoyed this event and you're interested in speaking at future webinars, please take a moment to click on the link on your screen now and apply. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your participation in the chat and thank you, Marnoush, for your time. We appreciate your continued support and everyone have a wonderful day and remember to stay current with Stukent. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.